Good morning. So good to see you this morning. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we are thankful to the Lord for his presence. Amen. And just excited. Next week is Mother's Day. So woo, let's celebrate our mamas. Don't forget about mamas. They're very important. And so let's, um, let's bring them. Amen. <laughs> let's, let's bless them. We want to um, remind you and make you aware of Friday Night Fire. That's this Friday night, 8 to midnight. We're going to gather together and pray. Uh, we skipped last month for a surprise birthday party, <laughs> but we are going to, um, we're going to hit it hard this month. And um, everything is built on the back of prayer, amen? And that's, that's the key. That's the key. So we want to pray and we want to believe God to um, see something powerful happen. And um, we want to encourage you to come and encourage you to make a list of the things that you want to see God do. And be specific. I love it because he's a specific God. We can make specific requests and then write down the dates of things that he's done, um, what, we've, what we've asked. He says to ask, seek, and knock. Amen? And so that's what we're doing. Uh, we want to read today from Revelation chapter 1, starting with verse 9. And it says this, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Then down in verse 12, it says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and death. Amen. Come on, let's stand and let's go to the Lord in prayer. And let's just begin to, to get a vision. Let's just begin to get a, 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 a picture in our mind of what he looks like. He's coming. Amen. He's coming. He's coming for a church. He's coming for a bride that's ready that's pure and spotless, and we want to be that bride that takes his breath away. Amen? Amen. Come on, lift your hands with me today. Lord Jesus, we just want to bless you. Lord, we want to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. God, we want to ask you, Lord, that you would just begin to prepare our hearts to worship, that you would begin to prepare our hearts to see you, Lord, to have a vision of you, Lord, to catch a glimpse of you, Lord, to lock gazes with your eyes. And today, oh God, I pray that you would do a heavy work in this house. Lord, that you would do a mind-blowing work in our lives, Jesus. Lord, that you would put your fingerprints all over our hearts and all over our souls. Oh, God, that we would walk out of here knowing that we've been touched by Almighty God. Lord, we pray today that you would heal those that need to be healed, God. We pray for my mom right now that you would raise her up and heal her body, Lord. And Lord, for anyone and everyone suffering, Lord, we pray that you would heal bodies and that you would restore hearts and souls and that you would make things right, Lord. We pray for relationships to be restored, Lord, for for um, hearts to be made um, right with you, God, and for, for, Lord, all of those questions that we have to be answered by your word today, Lord. We pray direction, Lord. We pray protection, and we pray the Spirit of the Lord to consume this house today. Lord, we want more of you. We desire more of you. We need you more. We pray for all those who are traveling and here, there, and everywhere, Lord. We're asking you, oh God, that you would minister and move in a powerful way, God. We want to see you. We want to know you. We want to love you. We want to we want to touch you today, God, with our praise and with our worship. Come on, church. Let's just begin to stir the spirit of God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are so good. You are worthy to be praised and adored. And we love you. 
And we honor you in Jesus' name. And everybody shout it. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's time to worship. Amen. He's worthy of our praise. Praise God. Amen. These are the days of Elijah Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses Righteousness be restored And though these are days of great trial Of famine and darkness and sorrow Till we are the voice in the desert Crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on cloud, shining like the sun, and trumpet call, lift your voice, so year of Jubilee, for out of Zion's hill salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel. The dry bones become in his flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as wide in your world. Still we are the laborers in your and you're declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on cloud, shining like the sun, and the trumpet call. Lift your voice, it's a year of Jubilee, for out of Zion till salvation comes. How many know there's no God like Jehovah? There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, he comes. Riding on the cloud, shining like the sun, and the trumpet call in your voice. To year of Jubilee, out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the cloud, shining like the sun, and the trumpet call in your voice. To year of Jubilee. Out of Zion till salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the cloud, shining like the sun, and the trumpet call in your hearts. To year of Jubilee, out of Zion till salvation comes. Lift your voice, to year of Jubilee, out of Zion till salvation Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Do you believe he's coming back? Yeah. You know what the Bible says? And he that hath this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. If you believe Jesus is coming, it's going to show up in the way you live. Amen. Praise the Lord. Take a moment, greet someone. We're so glad you're in the house. Welcome to our
Well, praise the Lord. I want to thank you in advance for your giving. And, uh, if you're watching online and you'd like to donate, there is a button you can click donate on. I know we've got folks scattered over the country today and, and uh, different ones that are sick watching online. And, and, uh, you know, when we, when we dismiss kids' church, it's like there's so, <laughs> sometime you'll have to go over and visit the other building just to <laughs> see that there's people over there as well. But anyway, we're so glad you're here today. Uh, do thank you for praying for my wife. She's not feeling well today. But uh, I, I don't know. Some 24, 36 hour bug or whatever. But uh, anyway, we believe the Lord is touching her even now. Thank you, as I said for your giving. God is faithful. How many know that he's promised to supply and meet every need? And as we covenant with him, as we partner with him, he opens the windows of heaven and pours out a blessing upon us that we cannot contain. And it's not just in what you receive, it's in what you're spared from spending. How many understand what I just said? It's, it's, it's not just what you receive, it's what you're spared from spending. It's the things that he helps you with in, in the unseen things, the, 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 the better deals on something, the wisdom to know how to fix something that otherwise you might have had to replace. There's so many ways that God can bless when we covenant with Him. And you know, just, just one word from Him can be worth a lifetime of your labor. You know, it's, it's, it's an amazing sometimes, just one different contact. You could save thousands and thousands of dollars. And, uh, you know, you just cannot out-give or outdo God. How many know He is awesome? He is preeminent. And when you partner with Him, great things happen. So thank you today. As you give, we're going to continue to worship. And I know that uh, before this day is out, we're going to be blessed above measure. I uh, had two sermons, one for tonight and one for this morning. And on the way down, I received yet another message. Well, I, I, peace be still. We're not going to try to preach all three of them to you today. But uh, I, I'm glad for that. I love it when God just, just you know, is like drinking from a fire hydrant. I can't type fast enough. And I, I, I thank God so much for that. But uh, either way, both messages are, are powerful because they're from God's Word. But and I'm still kind of just, Lord, which one do you want for this morning and which one do you want for tonight? I thought I had it all figured out until I got the other one on the way down. But, uh, you know, I, 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 hey, that is a great problem. And uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, that's one of those problems I'll receive every week. I praise God. I thank Him for His Word. I thank Him that His Word lives. Uh, the best thing you can do is hide His Word in your heart. David said, I hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's great when it's pitch black and there's no lights on in the middle of the night and scripture's flowing through your mind. You don't have to turn a light on. Scripture's flowing through your mind because you put it in your spirit. Amen? Thank God. Nothing greater, nothing greater in this world than to just wake up and meditate to God's word. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He's faithful. I'm so glad he is. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you for this offering. Lord, I pray that you will bless abundantly as we give and partner with you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. God bless you. Thank you as you give. Let's continue to worship. Church, this song is, is more than just a song. If you think about what he's saying, he's calling on God. Even so, come, Lord, no matter what. No matter what's going on in your life, praise him. Just ask him to come. He'll take care of the storm. He'll take care of the hurt. He'll take care of everything. You just got to call on it. And let's worship him with breakfast. Oh. 
all of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call every sinner, wake up the saints, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for the groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come for Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice, all will be new. Your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming soon. Wrapped in hate, 
I'll sing it, John. Come to me, whom shall I send? Oh, yeah, Lord. And I answered him. Oh, yes, I did. I will go for you. I'll say yes, Lord. And I cry, I cry, holy, holy is the Lord. And I cry, holy, holy is the Lord. Oh, sing it loud one more time. And I cry. Oh, come on, give me praise in this house today. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, praise team. God bless you. You may be seated. Glad you're in the house today. I want to urge you, move up just a little bit. You'll get more out of it. Look you in the whites of the eyes. Take a moment while they're, the worship team's coming back and just move this way just a little bit. Will you? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Praise the Lord. I've got a very powerful message today that uh, the Lord just kind of dumped in my spirit on the way down here. And usually 99% of the time my wife is with me. And so a lot of times I'll say, "Hun, I just need you to take some notes real quick while... God's just downloading this, and then when I get to church where I can pull out my computer and kind of, but uh, today I didn't have that luxury, so it just kept flowing over and over in my mind like drinking from a fire hydrant. But uh, I, I want to kind of preface some things I'm getting ready to say, so I hope you're listening with your best ear. Uh, I'm not really a, a, a fan of the horses. I don't play the horses. I very seldom watch horse racing, but I do make an exception on Kentucky Derby Day. And uh, I, I watched uh, not the whole five-hour proceedings leading up to it, which is so much hoop de la and fanfare and whatever, but I watched the running of the Kentucky Derby and instantly when it was over I began to get a message and uh, I thought I was going to preach that this morning but I believe I'm supposed to preach that tonight but it's a it's a very very powerful word never in the 145 years of of the running of the Kentucky Derby did what happened happen yesterday we are living in new times, if you please. There's a lot of momentous things that are happening. As, as I keep telling you, those things which have been etched in stone for years and set in concrete, so to speak, are, are being challenged and being, uh, nothing seems to be settled anymore. Have you, ha, have you noticed that? You know, we, we've still got people that are, are, are fighting uh, the, the election from two years ago. You know, it's just like nothing ever seems to be done or settled and I believe it's an hour and a day, the time that we're living, that the enemy's trying to steal your rest by nothing ever being settled in your spirit. It is a day that the enemy has pulled out all stops and sliming people, and, 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 and the rage of the hour seems to be sliming and false accusations and all of the fake news. And how many know the devil is the master of fake news? He's been doing it since the dawn of creation. He gave, he gave Adam and Eve the first fake news in the garden. You, you won't really die. You'll, you'll, you'll be like gods. He's been filling mankind with fake news ever since. 
I know I've said this before, and I only say that so you don't think, well, you know, wow, the pastor, he, he's losing it. No, I say it because we learn by repetition, and we learn by, by hearing something again and again. And I believe one of the most dangerous things in this last days is bearing false witness. And a lot of people don't understand what bearing false witness is. It's one thing to tell a lie and know it's a lie. It's another thing to repeat something somebody told you that you think is the truth and it's a lie. And you will stand before God and give an account. And some of the best sliming the devil does is using people that are trusted that are bearing false witness. You say, well, I know that person. They wouldn't tell me, that they wouldn't tell me wrong. Well, what about the person that told them? What about where it all originated from? You better walk in fear and trembling in these last days. The devil's name is slanderer. He is the accuser of the brethren. You know, you need to be careful. I don't want to ever be the devil's water boy. Can I get a witness? I don't want to ever be the devil's water boy. Somebody starts telling you a bunch of junk, you need to stop a mid-sentence and say, do you know that to be the truth? Why are you sharing this? Does this edify anybody? Does it build up anybody? Does it help anybody? If it doesn't, you're a slanderer and a gossiper and you are first cousin to the devil himself. Somebody shout now. So this world is, 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 is filled with all kinds of, 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 of just stuff that's just... You know, I was raised in the church. I've been going to church since before I was born. My mama took me. That doesn't make me holier than everybody else, but it, it does give me a legacy and a heritage. I thank God I was spared up from a lot of stuff growing up. I thank God I lived a sheltered life. I really did. I didn't even know much of hardly anything till after I got saved about what was going on. I really didn't. And, and, and you know, I, I went out into the world to a certain extent, and, and I did the bar scene, and I was there to meet young ladies, and I was there to whatever the world does. But somehow, God just always seemed to protect me. Somebody was praying. I'm just so glad they were. It just some, I, I can't tell you how many times God just interrupted my party and my plans. And I look back now, and I'm so glad He did. It was because somebody was praying. He protected me. He preserved my life. I'm so glad that I don't have to worry that I've got children that I've never met. Oh, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. I'm so glad. I don't have to worry about disease. Because I've been with one person on this planet, and that's my wife. I thank God for that. It wasn't because I was holier than everybody else. It's because God in His mercy kept His hand on me. It's because at the age of five years old, a man of God who'd stay in our home sometimes up to two months at a time, who would pray six and eight hours a day, walking back and forth, pacing. His idea was, if men can get up and go to their job and put in eight hours, I can put in eight hours of prayer and then go preach to them at night. That's the kind of home. That's the kind of atmosphere I grew up in. I can still remember like it was yesterday. That man of God standing at our front door, tears welling up in his eyes, and he reaching over and placing his hand on my head and praying a prayer blessing over my life. A man who prayed and people came back to life. A man who was powerfully used of God. That's the kind of legacy that was handed me. I was only five years old. I didn't understand it all. But I look back now and I believe that God in His wisdom and foresight and foreknowledge let that evangelist know that the call of God was on my life even at that young age. And I believe He prayed a special prayer. And God shielded me and protected me from all kinds of stuff. So glad He did. I wish somebody could shout. So glad. So glad. Listen, I, please, I, I don't want you to get this wrong. It's wonderful to hear testimonies about how God saved people from the dredges of sin, drug addiction, alcohol, everything under the sun, all of this wild stuff. Well, I'm just here to tell you the best, the best, the best testimony of all is that you lived for Him since you were little, right on up, and the only thing you ever got delivered from was M&Ms if you didn't want to. Hello, somebody shout yes. It really is good to just have His keeping power. I'm glad He kept me from a lot of stuff. 
I'm glad there's a lot of stuff I never craved because I never tried it, so there's no craving. Is anybody hearing what I'm trying to tell you? I've never craved caviar in my life. You know why, preacher? Because I've never had it. My mama didn't raise no dumb boy. You know, let the fish grow up. Hello, let the eggs hatch out. Let them grow up. I'm not paying $125 for a can of nonsense. Somebody shout yes. That just means maybe you've gotten too much money. Your, your, your priorities are messed up. Somebody in the world said cocaine is God's way of telling you you got too much money. I, I don't know about that, but it is a sure dumb thing to snort powder up your nose and destroy your mind. Listen, you only have one brain. You better take care of it. You know, I've met a lot of people in my life and some were fairly intelligent, but I've never met anybody yet brilliant enough to destroy brain cells. You need all you got. Touch your neighbor and say, you need every bit of it you got. You need it all. Trust me, you need all of it. You need it all. But we're living in an hour now in an age-old controversy, I would call it, as a title of this message, when it seems like for one of a better way of saying it, we've entered into like a, 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 a era or dispensation or a season, so to speak, of like greasy grace. It, it no matter what you do, it's, it's, it's okay, God's grace covers it all. That, that, that no matter how you live, it, it's really okay because it's, it's, it's not your righteousness, it's his righteousness. You know, and all that sounds so wonderful. And, and, and the very moment that I try to do anything at all, I have ceased from living in grace and now I've moved into works. And, and, and we're seeing the we're fruits of this twisted, unsound doctrine affect our nation as there, according to the Pew Report, there's a 20% decline across the United States in church membership and attendance is down across the board. And, and I don't even know if I should even mention these, these figures or not, but I heard one place where they said a million a month people less are attending church. I, I, don't, you know, I don't know if some of these, these figures, are, I hope, are just overblown and wild guesses by someone maybe from hell. Just how many know polls are, 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 are not really a reflection of the people as much as they're trying to change the, the opinion of the people by saying so many percent of people. And a lot of times there's nothing behind it but lying. I do know I've been told sixteen to eighteen hundred preachers are quitting the ministry every month. And then I heard someone say that they came out with another report that said it's it's nowhere near that many. But I do know everything sacred and everything good and decent is under attack. And I do know this: there's a siren song of Satan that if you listen to it, it'll shipwreck your faith. Listen, no matter how sophisticated we get, no matter how automated we get, no matter how high tech we get, God still has a plan for the local church and He's still intending on you showing up and being a part of an interactive worship time where we come together and bless His name as a body. And while when we're traveling and all over the place like we are today, hither and yon, and greetings to all watching today, by podcast because of that. We still want to stay connected. We still want to be faithful when we come back from our whatever and we have a place of belonging. Everybody understand what I'm talking about. Billy Graham said everybody needs three homes. An earthly home, a church home, and a heavenly home. I like that. But this age-old controversy over the battle of faith versus works as if one is... How do I say this? As if one is inconsequential, insignificant, or non-existent, and that somehow we have to choose between the two. Well, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible does not teach anything like that at all. You can lift a verse here and there, and that's the great danger of being a Scripture twister. You can take verses out of context, and at the end of the day, you can make things say just about whatever you want them to say. But you cannot, hello, you cannot cause that, that what is happening 
in, in, in this world is people that do not fully understand Scripture are allowing the teaching they're hearing to be totally one-sided. Okay. So having said that, let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7 and starting with verse 21. How many believe we can't go wrong if we're repeating the words of Jesus? I'm going to go out on a limb and tell you if Jesus said it, you should say it. I'm going to go out on a limb and say if Jesus believed it, you should believe it. I'm going to get, go out on another limb and say Jesus' words trumps all theologians. Jesus' words takes preeminence over everybody else's teaching. Jesus' words takes preeminence over every denominational hierarchy around the world bar none. And here's what Jesus said. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That one verse right there refutes this idea that all I have to do is believe and sit down and do nothing. Because true faith is an active faith. True faith is a living faith. True salvation will compel you to do something. Are you, are you, are you, are, hello, are you with me? So let's read on. Here's what Jesus said. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, or because of this, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. James tells us, faith without works is dead. Jesus is plainly telling us that it's more than just talk. Jesus is plainly telling us that how we live proves what we really believe. Can I get a witness? So this present mindset seems to be I'm saved by grace and grace alone. I'm required to give up nothing, do nothing, be nothing, and the moment I attempt to do or be, I cease from grace and enter into works. The only problem is that's not what Jesus taught or what Scripture teaches in context. True faith will cause me to do something. I'm not saved because of my works, but I will work because I am saved. Let me say that again. I'm not saved because of my works, but I will work because I am saved. Living faith because faith without works is dead. Again, I like the way Billy Graham said. Billy Graham said, we breathe in faith, we exhale works. How many know you can't live without doing both? You have to inhale and exhale. It was said another way, faith and works. It's like two oars. Anybody ever did any rowing and just tried to keep rowing on one side of the boat? What will you do? You'll go around in circles. You'll get nowhere in a hurry. James 2, 17 says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he had offered Isaac, his own son, upon the altar. How many know Abraham's considered the father of faith? How did he become the father of faith? By acting on the word of God. I tell you, it's not true faith today if you hear the word and do nothing because James says the man that hears the word and does nothing is like the man that looks in the mirror and he beholds what needs to be done and he does nothing about it and goes on his way. And the Word is the mirror. Can I get a witness? 
The Word is the mirror. We look into the Word and it's a reflection. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the Scriptures was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him, or counted unto his credit for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Oh, how many would like to be the friend of God? Amen. That's awesome stuff. Amen. Guess what? If you're going to be a friend of God, you're going to be what? An enemy to this world. Jesus said, marvel not that they hate you. They hated me without a cause. Marvel not. I'm telling you, there's people so wicked on this planet, they'll hate you just because you are good. They'll hate you just because you are doing the right thing. How many know you don't even have to say anything? All you have to do is show up. And if you're full of God, it'll put people under conviction. And I'm telling you, when God's really moving and the power of conviction's really flowing, you don't even have to be there. Just the recognition of who you are. One of the funniest stories I've ever heard in my life, and it was told to me by the person it happened to, they told on their self. They were backslid. They were running from God. And they went into High's store. Anybody remember High's? I don't know if there's any left or not, but there was High's, okay? I think a lot of them got bought out at the 7-Eleven or whatever, but this was a high store. And I was in that town for a revival. And this lady was backslid. She had used to go to that church. And one of the church members had taken a poster of the revival and got permission to put it in the window of the high store. And as she was standing at the counter with her six-pack wine cooler on the counter, she glanced over and saw my poster and said, Oh, shut up. I'm, te I was somebody. I'm telling you, God by His Spirit will convict you. You're just not going to be able to live, live any old way you want and think it's just going to be okay. The devil believes and trembles. It's going to take more than devil faith to make it. This may not be the most popular message on the planet, but guess what? If God wanted it changed, he'd already changed it in his word. I, I, I fear God, and I, I take right to heart that warning in the book that says, if you add to this message or you take away from this message, bad things is going to happen. And I think we need to preach the whole counsel of God. He is a God of grace. He is a God of mercy. And I cannot buy one drop of his blood by any of my efforts. But it is a lie from hell to tell people you can sit down and do nothing. You don't have to turn from anything. You don't have to repent from anything. You don't have to give up anything. You don't have to deny anything, and you'll be okay because that's not what te Scripture teaches. And listen, I I'm not trying to, you know, pat myself on the back till I break my arm, but I just want to ask you a question. How many preachers that you see on television or anywhere else are actually telling you the whole truth. We have focus groups. We poll these groups. And I'm not saying every church as large as, is this way. I, I don't believe that for a moment. But one extremely large church, the guy has a panel of 30 that he presents his sermon to, and they read it over and mark it up and critique it and hand it back to him, and he write, rewrites it, and it goes to a smaller group, and they look it over, critique it, and mark it up and give it back to him, and then he finishes the final draft and preaches it. Guess what? Don't hold your breath, because that ain't going to happen here. Somebody shout, yes. I said, that ain't going to happen here. Don't hold your breath. It's not my job to worry about whether you like it or not. My job is to tell the truth. I hope you like it because you like the truth. But if you don't like the truth, your, your, your argument's with somebody a whole lot bigger than me. Hello. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't write the menu. I just got one job, serve it and serve it hot. I'm just supposed to come through the swinging doors of the kitchen with, 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 with the steam coming off the plate. Now, I've been in his presence. I've heard from him. Now, here's the food. 
I, I just would tell you this. You can find just about whatever you're looking for nowadays. And you can live accordingly to whatever you want to dumb the gospel down to. But when you stand before God, it's not going to be according to those standards you're going to be judged by. It's going to be the almighty, unchangeable, unalterable, irrefutable, irreplaceable, immutable word of almighty God that will stand the test of time. And he said, be ye therefore holy as I am holy. So we're going to have to make an effort to live right. Let the church say yes. We're going to have to make an effort to do what's right. And then we're going to have to rely on his grace. Because can't none of us do right without his grace. So don't twist what I'm saying either. If it's all about me, Jesus died in vain. But if it's all about what Jesus did and I do nothing, then I've messed up the gospel too. Because guess what? Repentance is work. And if you don't know that, you've never repented of anything. The word repent means to turn away from. Paul said, I die daily. How many think it's hard to die to the flesh? How many think if you try to put the flesh down, the flesh will scream? How many know the problem with a living sacrifice that always tries to crawl off the altar? That's why the scripture said, bind the sacrifice with cords to the altar. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me and gave himself for me. But I still have to show up and submit myself to him. You see then that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I'll say it one more time. While none of my works could ever buy one drop of Jesus' blood, true faith demands action. We must believe. We must confess. We must repent. We must continue. There's a battle for our souls. It's called fight the good fight of faith. How many understand fighting is effort? I think one of the biggest things that's wrong with the church in America is we've got people that signed up for a picnic when in reality it's a battle. You know, you won't quit at the drop of the hat if you understand you weren't invited to a picnic. If you've been invited to a picnic and there's too many ants and there's a couple mosquitoes, then you can just decide to cut the picnic short. Don't, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. But if you've signed up to be a soldier of the cross, if you've signed up to be a soldier of the Lord Jesus, then you're going to have to show up whether you feel like it. You're going to have to do stuff whether you feel like it. You're going to have to say, I take my orders from the commander-in-chief, and you're going to have to live according to him. How many understand that people that are down in a low rank don't tell the general what to do, how to do, when to do, what to And we got a whole world today that just feels like they can just write their own ticket and do whatever they want. So we have, in any given church, we have adherents. Hello. We have members. We have disciples. And we have soldiers. I really hope and pray before God that you make it into the disciple and soldier part. Because I can't read anywhere, anywhere in here where the adherents and the members. Jesus said, go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples. A disciple is a disciplined one. A disciple is one who has done the things the master has told him to do and has put everything else behind but what the master's will is. That's not always popular to say. 
But as one songwriter said, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. Can I tell you this morning, and listen, I have no desire for, for, for persecution and trouble. I like peace just like all of you. But can I tell you, the church overseas looks a whole lot different than the church here in America. Where it takes all night to have one service. Where you have to gather at an hour, a half an hour at a time, and stand around the walls of a basement with no lights, and windows darkened to maybe one or two candles, and whisper your hymns, and share a torn page out of the Bible that another family memorized the week before, and you trade pages with them. And we're so busy, we got Bibles stacked everywhere, and we can't even read at all. Where you have to be baptized in the middle of the night in a 55-gallon barrel drum because to be baptized in public is a death warrant. In some countries, just because of the family you're born into, that's your religion. And if you change it all, you're, you're, you're branded an infidel and, 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 and the eldest in the family is sworn to kill you and your life becomes a living hell as everything you know of to be around you as security is stripped from you just because you've decided to follow Jesus. And yet, much of the church today in America can't get out of bed. I can't even get out of bed. I can't even get out of bed to make it. You can get mad at me if you want, but I'm going to tell you something. Feeding your soul ought to be priority number one in these last days. And instead of staying up till 1 and 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning on Saturday night, maybe you ought to try to, just, just a helpful hint from your pastor. Maybe you ought to like try to like turn in just a little early so you can wake up with enough lucidity and enough acuity of brain that you can make it to church and actually get something out of the sermon. Somebody shout yes. I realize that's like, you know, really like, like tough talk, but... You know, guess what? If you, if you were having a big game or you were having a big test or, or you were having a, a, an important job interview, you'd try to get some rest the night before and you'd try to be your best and you'd try to be, hey, I'm talking about how to prepare yourself to come into the courts of the king. We have some responsibility. We need to do something. Your soul is at stake. So I not only must believe, and it's got to be more than a devil faith, I, I've got to, I've got to confess. Now, confess is different from repent. Confess is agreeing with God that the thing in question is wrong. But then repent means I turn from the thing in question and walk the other way. Continue means it's not a one-time deal. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. It's not a prayer when you were 12 years old and go your way for the rest of your life and I've checked the religion box and, and heaven's my home no matter what happens. No, 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 no. You, 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 you've fallen into some serious false doctrine. There is no such thing as unconditional eternal security or once saved, always saved as most people know it by Hebrews chapter 12 very plainly tells me that if I receive not discipline upon which all are partakers, that I make myself illegitimate and not a son. I've had people with a straight face tell me that you're born into a family. No matter what you do, you're still part of that family. And they try to use that analogy that, you know, once you come to this altar and pray a little prayer, you're okay for the rest of your life. It's not so because you can literally be disowned and cut out of this family and disinherited by walking in sin and rebellion. That's what the Scripture teaches. It's called backsliding. It's called falling away. The Bible says, cast not away therefore your confidence, which have great recompense or reward. For ye have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and shall not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 to 39. You cannot draw back from a place you've never been. To draw back is a military con connotation. In fact, 
It's another, uh, uh, it's actually a maritime sailing connotation here. The Greek word for draw back there is hupastello, which literally means a letting down or a slackening of the pace by pulling in the sails. You can't just say, well, I've already done that and I'm good for the rest of my life. No, 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 no. We're also supposed to be the bride of Christ. Can I get a witness? But can I tell you, we're betrothed, but the wedding hasn't taken place yet. And you being evil would not continue to marry someone that was two-timing you on the side while you were engaged. We are in engagement. The wedding has not taken place yet. We are the bride-to-be. And that bride must keep herself pure and spotless and without wrinkle for her bridegroom. And the bridegroom's about to come back. And while the bridegroom tarries, the Bible says they all slumbered and slept. We're living in sleepy spiritual times. It's hard to keep people awake. A pastor friend of mine who's, who's, who's now in eternity, we were close friends. He, he died at a rather young age in a tragic accident. But at the time, our relationship as far as ministerially was, I was guest evangelist, he was pastor. I preached for him on a number of occasions. And he said something at the time when I was an evangelist, I never fully really grasped like I do now that I'm a pastor, but he said, pastoring is like spinning plates. What did he mean? You get one person going real good, there's somebody over here wobbling. You go over there and you give them a spin, you turn your back, and then over here it starts wobbling again. And you got to go over and give them another. And it's a constant, constant, constant. And I'm going to say this in love. I, hello, I want to say this in love, but I want you to put on your big boy girls and pants and receive it. When you've been in church for a while, the pastor shouldn't have to keep spinning you. You ought to be spinning your own self and reaching out to somebody else that's wobbling. Can I get a witness? There ought to be a time where you, you, you're big enough to spin your own. Hello. Some people, their excuse is, well, I, I'm not being fed. Well, why don't you try feeding yourself? You know, it's one thing to play airplane with your two-year-old grandson with the spoon and all that. But, you know, when they get 12, it's an insult. Now, come on, I'm preaching better than you're shouting right now. I said, when they get 12, it's an insult. I'd rather not have to insult you. I don't want to have to play airplane spoon today to get you to, I want you to just set up like a big boy and girl and say, preach, preacher. If it steps on my toes, clear up to my neck. I want to receive it because I want to make heaven my home. Running from difficulty doesn't change difficulty. Running from something doesn't change it. You're going to have to confront it. And the God who saved you, has promised to keep you, will help you. But you're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. And by the way, you don't wear battle armor to a picnic. Uh, let, let me just wait for the roar of amens to die down before proceeding. You, you don't wear battle armor to a picnic. And this armor doesn't fall down from heaven. It's put on by you and I. Which, if we have to put it on, that kind of sounds like work, doesn't it? Uh, does, uh, come on, somebody help me. Does that kind of sound like work? If I have to put it on. You know, if we're, if we're not careful, we can get so lazy spiritually that, that it reminds me of the story I was told as a kid. There was an old guy out in the countryside by the name of Clem. And Clem was so lazy, they decided they were just going to go ahead and bury him while he was still alive. And Clem wasn't even 
resisting. He laid down on the funeral bier. They were carrying him out of town. And Farmer Brown came by in his wagon and said, Ho, boys, ho, what's going on here? He said, well, we're burying Clem. He's just so shiftless and so lazy. So we're just going to just, just, just bury him. It's, we're, we're done with this. And Farmer Brown said, well, well hey, let, let's give him one more chance. And Farmer Brown looked over at Clem lying on the funeral bier, and he said, Clem, he said, I got a, got a load of corn here. He said, would you like some? And Clem raised up and looked. He said, is it shucked? And he said, no. He said, well, drive on, boys. You know, we, we, we're living in a day spiritually where you got to shuck it, you got to shell it, you got to... Hello? A mama bird actually chews the worm up and then puts it in the baby. Oh, listen, that's kind of gross. I don't want to have to chew the... Hello? You, you're going to have to work with me. You're going to have to say, hey, I'm a big boy now. Pa hey, pastor, I'm a big girl now. Just lay it down. Just throw it down. I'll pick it up. Hello? I'll just, I'll just go on and pick it up. I, I can take it from here. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on. Just a tiny part of the armor. Is that what it says? I just want to kind of make sure y'all are like dialed in. They don't say put on part of it. Huh. You mean you're going to have to go to whole food spiritually? You're not just going to be able to eat the dessert? You know, I, I'm just not much on, like, fake stuff. I'm not much on, like, whipped cream. You know, that's like, to me, it's like hypocrite ice cream. Just give me the ice cream. My wife and I will share a dessert, you know, sometimes. These great big desserts they have nowadays, they're made for, like, two people. Actually, they're actually probably made for six people. But two people can, like, find plenty of sin on that one plate. But my wife loves whipped cream, so I'll just say, hey, baby, I have that. You, can, you know, I, I don't like hypocrite stuff. If we're going to go ahead and do it, let's do the real thing. Just go on and put a glob of ice cream on top of that thing. And I don't like excessive icing. It's too much. It, like, just like turns in my mouth it's just too sweet so I'll scrape a lot of it off to the side and and I know my wife's watching by podcast this morning hi hon I love you but she'll like scrape that icing up she loves that ice she loves that whipped cream so we make a good team on that stuff but listen and she does okay she eats a whole lot of other stuff that's really healthy stuff that I mean she eats broccoli about every time we go out she has broccoli and I'm she offers me some, and I'll just, because I know it's good for me, not because I like it, I'll like her take of one little tree. And I leave the forest on her plate. Maybe that's her way of making up for the whipped cream and the icing. But what I'm trying to tell you is, honey child, you're going to have to have more than whipped cream and icing to make heaven your home. You're actually going to have to you're actually going to have to chew on an old gnarly piece of meat every once in a while. Somebody shout, yes. You're going to have to, like, eat something that sticks by your spiritual ribs. Yeah. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you'll be able to stand against the wiles, the tricks, the lies, the deceit, the fake news of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your, your, your battle's not really with that person you see. It's with the spirit that's driving them. The spirit that's driving them that's in conflict with your spirit. How many know there's kingdoms in conflict? I'm going to say it again. You don't even have to open your mouth to be in trouble with some people. They hate you because of who you are. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, because of this, take unto you. Boy, there it is again. Whole armor. Whole armor. You know, I didn't know I was going to say this, but all of this descriptive 
armor here is, it literally comes from the Roman times. And if you read about history, and I read the most part of Edward Gibbon's the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. It's huge volumes. It's, 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 it, it, it's a tome. And the things that happened, Rome did not fall overnight. Rome's decadence finally destroyed the strength and the manliness of their armies, that they were no longer in a place of virility and strength to protect themselves. They literally collapsed on the weight of their own corruption. As the writer of those times would put it, the people loved breads and circuses. They literally entertained themselves to destruction. In the king's forest, if you killed an animal in hunting in the king's forest, you could receive the death penalty, but you could pay a certain amount of money to the authorities and kill somebody you didn't like and you wouldn't even go to jail. That's how corrupt things had become. I heard the words of a state senator from Alabama this morning on my television that literally galled me to my, my, my core as he said, you know, abortion, you're just killing the child that nobody wants now instead of waiting and killing them later. How many heard that? I challenge you, Google it. If you think I'm, if you think I'm exaggerating it, you Google it. I quoted him almost word for word. How much more of a shock do you need? How much more of a slap in your face do you need to stop supporting stuff that's wicked? I'm going to tell you something. The, the bloom is off the rose. The genie's out of the bottle. The, the Pandora's box is open. You don't have anything to hide behind. You can't dress yourself up in the fig leaves of this world and say you can stand and support that kind of stuff. And, you know, we can condemn him, and what he said should be condemned, but listen, 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 I'll just have to give the devil his due. At least he had enough guts to say what everybody else already knows is the truth, but acts like it isn't. You know something? If a mama cat has, is pregnant with kittens and you leave the mama cat alone, what will it have? Let the church say, duh. If a dog is pregnant with puppies and you leave the dog alone, what will the dog have? So if a human being is pregnant and you leave it alone, what would it have? This absolute nonsense that all of a sudden it's not a baby till it's here. And then the latest outrage is we even have a chance to decide even after it's born what we can do. The spirit of Nazism is alive and well on this planet. Anti-Semitism is on a rise. These age-old spirits are recycling themselves again. And we're here at the very brink of the very edge of the very precipice of the coming, the very cusp of the coming of the Lord. And the enemy's trying his best to get you to buy a cheap bill of goods. It's time to remain faithful. It's time to remain faithful. It's time to hold fast to the things which you've learned and not let them slip. It's time to stay with the tried and the true and the tested. It's time to not be carried about by every wind of doctrine and slight cunning of hand of the enemy of your soul. Can I get a witness? It's time. It's time to grow up. It's time to say, Lord, help me mature in you. It's time to say, Lord, help me. Help me to stand for what's right. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. 
that you be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore if your loins girt about with truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. What are the fiery darts of the wicked? The lying accusations of hell that he's constantly hurling at you. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But I want to go back for a moment and talk about, above all, taking the shield of faith. In the early days of the Roman Empire, Roman soldiers were issued a shield that was so big they could actually hide behind it. And when they laid siege to a city, this shield was wrapped over with leather and it was made out of wood. And because there would be fiery arrows that would be shot down from the castle walls to these soldiers, they would immerse and dip and soak and immerse and dip and soak this huge shield in the river until it was saturated with water so that when that fiery arrow would hit the shield, it might stick in the shield, but it would sizzle and it would, it would die because of the moisture in the shield that would not allow the, the, the shield to catch on fire, thus exposing them to the enemy with no protection. I'm telling you, it's time we get full of the water of the Holy Ghost that we not allow the fiery darts of the enemy to catch fire in us and cause shipwreck to our faith. But as time went on, they began complaining in the ranks, the shield is too heavy. It's too big. It, it, it's too hard to handle. And they, co they constantly narrowed it down and, and made it smaller and made it smaller and the requirements became less and less. And they finally collapsed upon their own decadence. The devil's not trying to get you just to quit all at once. He just wants to take you out by a little bit at a time. Death by a thousand cuts. This week, it's this thing you don't like. Next week, it'll be another little thing you don't like. And next week, another little thing. And then you put it all together. Now all you've got is a basket full of complaints. You forgot all about the goodness of God and all he ever did for you and all the blessings you got in church and how many times God touched you and how his presence flowed like a river and how many times you left the altar blessed and full of, of God and felt like a bucket of honey had been turned over in your soul. But now all you've got is a bucket of complaints. It's the enemy that's at work. Don't, 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 don't shout me now when I'm preaching good. How I many I'm telling you the truth? We can all find what we're looking for. On any one given Sunday, in any given church, you can find one thing you don't like. And you can focus on that. Or you can purpose in your mind. I've come to receive of the Lord. And I'm not going to allow the enemy to rob me, cheat me, dupe me, detour me, or deter me. I'm going to receive what I came for. I'm going to set at his feet and receive. I'm going to set at his feet and learn of him. I'm going to make it. Because I've purposed. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So let me ask you one of those no-brainer questions, but I still want you to respond. Have you ever been tempted? Has anybody ever been tempted? How many know temptation has a way of making you feel dirty? Even though you don't do it, you don't even have to do it, you just feel, you, you just feel dirty. But it's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to yield to the temptation. But how many know when you're tempted, there's a battle that takes place? The Bible says that every man when he's tempted He's drawn away with his own lust and enticed. 
Let no man say when he's tempted, he's tempted of God. But he's tempted of his own lust and drawn away of enticed. Listen, the devil knows what you like. He's going to try to present you with something that you like. There are certain things you just can't tempt me about. I have no interest in it. On a scale of 1 to 10, it's about a minus 15. It doesn't bother me at all. There's other things that's different. You can't tempt me with a bowl of spinach. I don't care if it is in 24 karat gold leaf, your mama's private china pattern from 1749 that only privileged guests even get to look at. That's not, that don't bother me. But if you put some Briar's peach ice cream on the counter, how about it, John, in a beat-up Tupperware bowl and turn your back, it'll be gone in a New York minute because now you're talking my language. The devil knows what your love language is. The devil knows what your mess is. And he wants to get you to rub all in it. You know, have you ever noticed something about a dog and all you dog lovers just peace be multiplied? It's the truth. You let a dog out the house, he'll go find the stinkiest mess he can get in and he'll roll all in it. He'll just rub all, roll all in it like that's the best thing on the planet. And then he'll run straight for you for love and want to come in the house and lay down on the carpet in the living room and And some of y'all are supposed to be big enough now spiritually that when your dog gets out, and you say, hey, ho, oh, oh, ho, hey. We're not going there. It's too hard to clean up. It's too much effort to get back on track. I wish somebody had preached, say, preach. It's too hard to get back. And even after it's over, you're still self-conscious about the smell. And you walk with, do you smell anything? Huh? I, I tell people, you know, that's why I try to splash a little cologne on before I preach because I work and I sweat. And, I, and then I feel like, like you know, I'm kind of self-conscious after the service. You know, I, don't, I want to get downwind, you know, I want to make sure I'm still okay. But how many know we're living in a stinky world? And you need to come in and be baptized with the power of the Holy Ghost. You need heaven's aroma to just flood your soul again and cancel out the stink of the hell. Get that mess out of your nostrils. H have you ever died to self? Has there ever been any, something you really, really, really wanted to do and you knew you had no business doing it? And you said no and walked away. That's dying to self. And how many know it took effort? It took effort. But we've got people today that have gotten so crazy. They're like, well, you know, if the Lord wants me to quit this, he'll, he'll, he'll just take it away from me. i got news for you. God's not going to come down and slack, slap the Jack Daniels out of your hand. He's not going to slap the joint out of your hand. He's not going to knock the bong out of your hand. Don't y'all shout me down when I'm preaching good. If you don't know what a bong is, it's a pipe used to smoke marijuana. So how do you know that, Pastor? I was just told that, okay? Just thought I'd just... I'm serious. I, I never... Thank God, I never smoked. I'm not telling you I was, I, was, I was holy. I'm just telling you, thank God, that's one thing I never got into. But God's not going to come down to heaven and just smack that out of your hand. You're going to have to walk away from it. Hey, everybody still love me? Is it okay to tell you the truth? You, you know, hello? Well... Lord, if you want me to stop drinking, just come down and open the refrigerator and pour it all down the sink. I'll just sit in the living room while you're doing it. Just let me know when you're done. Are we kidding? But I think we've gotten that. That's where we are in the world today. We don't want to put forth any effort. We don't think we have any skin in the game. We don't think we have to deny ourselves of anything. And yet, if we're not careful, we're going to head for a great and terrible surprise. Because in the end, 
Jesus is the judge. And he says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, but he that does. And we're going to have to live with what we built. I've told this illustration a couple months ago, but it bears repeating, and I'm closing with this. Years and years ago, a man lost everything during the Great Depression. He was completely wiped out. And there were those people who were extremely wealthy that survived. And in fact, some even thrived because they were able to buy up things pennies on the dollar because they didn't have the indebtedness. And this man who his father had lived during that era and time was not aware or privy of all of his father's friends. But he got into construction and he bid on a state contract of so many miles of highway and for X amount of money and he won the bid. He outbid everyone but he was not aware of the topography. He had not done his homework well enough and just under, just under the surface of the topsoil was a solid ridge of granite that ran for miles and he ended up having to dynamite every foot of the way building that road and the cost overruns bankrupted him. It made the news and he was called into a man's office that he did not know one day, a very wealthy man, a very influential man, a very successful businessman and he said, you don't know me, he said, but I know you your father and I were friends in the Depression. And he said, your father loaned me $400 in a time when I had nothing. And I am large in part today what I am today because of your father helping me. And he said, I want to return the favor to his son. I've heard about your misfortune. He said, I'm going to be in Europe for the next six months traveling. He said, but I want you to build me a house. On the outskirts of town, there's a hill. It's a beautiful prime piece of property. Here's the blueprints. I've arranged with the bank for you to take a draw every week. All you've got to do is turn into the receipts and your time, and you'll get a draw. When I get back in six months, we'll settle up. So the man thought to himself, here's a job. There's no supervision. This was before the days of all types of inspectors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he, he thought, this is my chance to get back on my feet. So he altered how many yards of concrete went into the footer. He, he spread out the studding in the walls from 16 on center to 2 and 3 feet. And every place he could, he made all of these shortcuts. And cosmetically, he covered them up. And he altered things on the receipt so it would match and... He pocketed the extra money, and at the end of the six months, he'd finished the house. He walked into the man's office, and he handed him a key. He said, you can come out and look at the property. It's finished. Here's the key. And he said, here's the final tally of everything. And the man reached in his middle drawer, and he said, that won't be necessary. And he pulled out a deed of the property, and he signed his name at the bottom and handed it to the man and said, this is just my small way of saying thanks for what your father did for me. True story. The man had to live with what he had built. He lived there on that hill for several years, but every time a thunderstorm would come up in the summertime, every time the wind would get up and the house would literally shudder and he would hear it creak and groan on the foundation, finally in a particularly bad storm one night, his mind snapped he died insane because he had to live with what he built. I'm telling every one of you this morning, you're going to have to live with what you've built for all eternity. You can't afford to build wrong. So it's effort to say no. It's effort to turn from sin and Satan, it's effort to walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Paul said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means after I preach to others, I myself should become a castaway. 
I had more, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude with that. I'm just asking you in these last days. I'm, 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 I'm not only asking you, I'm pleading that you be careful that whatever you hear that sounds all so wonderful and great, you keep it in the full context of Scripture. I want you to understand I celebrate grace. I'm glad for grace. We're all here today because of grace. But we are never to take God's grace and turn it into a cloak of lasciviousness. We're never to take God's grace and turn it into a license to sin. We're never to take God's grace and just wallow in it like a child playing in a mud puddle after a storm. Because when we do that, we trample underfoot the blood of Jesus and count the holy covenant as an unholy thing. And we don't want to be guilty of that. So we celebrate grace. But we do our part with God's help to turn from all wickedness and live a righteous life before him. Can I get a witness? That's the challenge of the day. That's the word that will keep us all starting right here. Listen, I want to make it. I want to have an abundant entrance. I don't want there to be any surprises. I don't want to be that part. That, that, and, and Jesus said it would be many. Many in that day would say, Lord, Lord. And he said, I don't know you. And it doesn't mean a mental acquiescence in that he did not know who they were. It meant we've never been intimate. You took my name, but you didn't take my commandments. You took my name, but you didn't take my character. You took my name, but you didn't take my holiness. You took my name, but you only went through the motions. I want to make it. Jesus said, enter in the straight gate, for straight is the gate, and there's a way which leads to life. A few there be that find it, because broad is the way, and wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. It's not about what's the most greatest, mostest, bestest, whatever, and I know I'm butchering English when I say that, but I meant to do it. But it's not the mostest, bestest, greatest, whatever. It's what's according to the word of Almighty God. That's going to judge us at the end. And we don't want to be disqualified. Bow your hearts. Father, I thank you today for your word. It is forever settled in heaven. It is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. It is the hope of which we cling to. It is the true north. It is the anchor of our soul. It is the rock that doesn't move. And it is what our confidence rests upon. So Lord, I pray today, God, that we'll, we'll not try to settle for one or the other, but we'll embrace all of your word. We'll embrace the whole counsel. We'll work because we believe and we'll mix our faith with our works our works with our faith and at the same time simultaneously trust wholeheartedly in your shed blood and righteousness because our own righteousness is but filthy rags after it's all said and done we know we still we still need you more. Thank you, Lord. Stand with me, will you? This has become one of my favorite songs. Just recently heard it, and I just I fell in love with it instantly. Just bring that song up just a little bit, if you will. Let's just worship for a moment. I love what it says. Come on, just lift your hands all over the house today. Would you just say, good is the word of the Lord. Lord, let me take it. Let me eat of it. Let me digest it. Let, let it. let it find lodging deep in my heart, deep in my spirit. Let it take root today. Let it take root, Lord. Let it take root. Jesus, I pray. Lord, we don't want to just be hearers and not doers. Oh, hallelujah. 
I'm not going to take a whole lot of time. I'm just going to do it this way real quick. I wonder how many in this place would say, Pastor, message received. I needed to hear this today. We're living in a day and hour where it's just too much being left out. And I still know I need the full counsel. You just wave at me, wave at me. Thank you. I see hands all over, all over this building. There's too much being left out. There's too much of what's not being unsaid. There's the other edge nobody seems to be talking about. Oh, Jesus, what a song. Wow. Drink those words into your heart. Oh, thank God. Unlike you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. You are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Will you meet me here? I'm going to have a prayer of blessing together. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, just sing it with him. Yes, amen, Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, Jesus, we bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. On your love, it is a firm foundation. My trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. There is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me oh hallelujah what a song what a song what a song thank you lord for your presence today oh we love you jesus hallelujah Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, Savior. Yes, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Stretch your hands this way. The Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you rest. The Lord bless you going out, you're coming in, you're rising up and you're sitting down. The Lord make you the head and not the tail, the first and not last. The Lord bless the work and labor of your hands that you may have more than enough that you may be able to give to those that are without, that they may know and see and understand the greatness of your God. I'll reverse and declare null and void any spell, incantation, work of darkness against this body, this house, and I pray it back on the head of those who send it sevenfold that they may know and understand. There is a power greater. There is a name above every name. There is a name by which every knee will bow 
and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want to invite you now voluntarily just to declare with me on the count of three, Jesus is Lord. Would you do that with me? One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Greet someone. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Praise God.